Okay. Your name's Ian. <laughs> Alright, well, brothers, we don't mind going ahead. Short and simple prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for all that you have done for us. Uh, God, we know you are uh, our Father, our provider. Uh, God, you, you give us all good things, especially we want to thank you for your salvation, your forgiveness of sins, and we can be abundantly uh, cleansed and healed and pardoned of all that stands against us. Father, we ask that you help us always with all the, the troubles of this life. Uh, we know that we have you to lean on, uh, but uh, many things uh, are difficult. Help us always to look to you for guidance and uh, also to each other, God, as we uh, uh, stand together as a family. And uh, God, we just ask that uh, at this time as we study, uh, that we know that, uh, God, these, these scriptures are, are not just for uh, knowledge and learning, but these scriptures are about you. Uh, and so that's what we're trying to attain, God. Uh, we're trying to seek out you and, and learn more about you, and we know that will uh, guide us closer our relationship and our walk with you. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I appreciate Brother Randy who covered for me uh, last Wednesday. I believe he said that he was going to go ahead and do a lesson from the Sermon on the Mount. So I believe that's what he did. Uh, yeah, dudes. Which is, yeah, dudes, yeah, 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 he's excellent. Well, I appreciate him uh, covering that and I appreciate uh, Hunter covering for me this past Sunday, even though it was last minute. I had a feeling it was so, but I appreciate it, brother. It means a lot. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and continue with our original uh, Wednesday night class through the book of James. And I know it's been two weeks, uh, but I'll go ahead and kind of ask a little bit of uh, review questions. Uh, we left off at verse 18 of chapter 3. And in that section, what has James been discussing? wisdom comes from where wisdom comes from now how many types of wisdom are there uh, according to James how many types of wisdom earthly and uh, spiritual earthly and spiritual wisdom or wisdom from above yeah. and so there's two types now originally yeah when we think about it worldly wisdom is not really any type of wisdom it's foolishness but I like to use the words of what James says, and so he shows that there is two. Uh, worldly wisdom, which is demonic, uh, uh, natural, and what? Uh, it's demonic, English. natural, demonic. and demonic. sensual, English. earthly, demonic. Yes, sensual, English. earthly, demonic, or however your translations has it. And then so that's the characteristic of worldly wisdom. And what is the result of worldly wisdom? Confusion and every evil thing. Yeah. Confusion and every evil thing. Now, specifically, who was he writing about in the context? To Christians. To Christians at the Church of Christ in Jerusalem. And to the teachers. Mostly to the teachers, absolutely. And we'll come back to that in just a few moments. But in contrast, there is wisdom from above. And what are those characteristics that we covered two weeks ago? Pure, peaceable, mm -hmm. full of mercy. Full of mercy. Gentle. Gentle. No partiality. No partiality. Without hypocrisy. Without hypocrisy. There's one more. Can we say willing to yield? Willing to yield, which would be open to reason, okay. is the way that um, it's translated. Open yeah. to reason or reasonable. Yeah. And those are the characteristics of the wisdom that is from above. <clears throat> and we looked at those characteristics and we showed how it correlates from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Because James is the practical commentary of what? The Sermon on the, the, Sermon on the Mount. Mount. Now, as we continue where we left off, Closing this chapter with verse 18, he shares with us the results of 
having wisdom from above, having these characteristics. Here are the results of wisdom from above. Verse 18, and the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. All right. Again, I already asked the question, but as the law of repetition states, the more you ask it, the more you say it, the what? The more you retain it. The more you retain it. So, in the context, keeping it in the context, who is he writing about? The Christians. Uh, the, he's reading the, the ones that have the, the heavenly wisdom in the church, isn't he? Yes. He's just telling them there. Two different types of wisdom: yeah. worldly wisdom, and then there's wisdom from above. But now, again, in the context, who is he writing about? He's writing about who? You already said it earlier. Teachers. Teachers. The church. Teachers. There we go. Yeah, the church. Yes, yeah. the Church of Christ at Jerusalem. That's full of Christians and teachers. The teachers is what he is talking about. So going back to earlier in the chapter, since the very beginning of chapter 3, verse 1, what kind of teacher we are. That is what he's talking about. What kind of teacher we are. Teachers are to sow the seed into the hearts of men. And what is the seed? The word. the word of God. Go back to chapter 1, because James already gave us the idea of the word being a seed. Somebody read verse 21 of James chapter 1. <clears throat> Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. The what word? Implanted. Implanted. Implanted word. What do we do with the seed? You plant, plant it. it. You plant it. Teachers. And again, as Christians, we're all called to be teachers. Am I right? Mm -hmm. It is our duty to sow the word into the hearts of men. The seed is the word of God, as Jesus used uh, the same imagery in regards to the parable of the sower. When you go to Matthew chapter 13, verse 3 through 9, and verse 18 through 23. Earlier, James had used this seed analogy, as from what we read in chapter 1, verse 21. Both sowing and implanting the seed is teaching the word, and that should result in what? Righteousness. Righteousness. That is, having a right relationship with God. And going back again to chapter 1, a person whose heart is filled with anger, do they receive that righteousness? Somebody read verse 20 of chapter 1. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. When it comes to the preaching, teaching, the sowing, and the implanting of the word of God into the hearts of men, it's all going to determine what kind of heart they have, what kind of soil they have. And if they are slow to speak, quick to hear and slow to anger, then it's going to result in righteousness. But if they get angry over what the Word has to say, is it going to result in righteousness? No. no, it's not. It will not and won't be. The teaching of some of the folks being addressed by James is causing conflict and division. Those teachers that have worldly wisdom. So, he reminds them that it must be sown in peace by people who are committed to peace and not division. What does a person who is committed to peace look like? What is he wanting souls to have? He's wanting them to have peace. Peace. Peace that results what? From the implanted word. From the implanted word. When the uh, the seed is implanted in the hearts of men, and they receive it with good soil. It results in righteousness. Having a right relationship with God, bringing what? Peace in their life. Not division, but peace. And teachers, we are called 
to have the attitude and the want for souls to have a right relationship with God. If that is our goal in mind, I want to thank souls. If we have souls on our mind and we want them to have a right relationship with God, then you are one who is sowing for what? Peace, right? Peace. <clears throat> but now, when there's teachers, who are too focused on themselves, who are a little bit self-conscious, <coughs> arrogant, thinking that they know all the answers and have all the answers, and souls are not on their mind, what's going to be the result? Chaos. 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 The result will be chaos. Corey, I think of... Uh this idea of peace versus the opposite of peace, you know, you think of maybe war or, you know, being in agony or anxiousness or something like that, but I, I kind of compare it to that of like a, a doctor who sees somebody in terrible pain and they do something about that to give them peace or comfort. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like, I think of like a doctor who's normally works in a hospital or something like that, but they're they're walking down the street, and let's just say they see somebody who's in agony, and they're like, they know exactly right then and there, and they have everything they need to give that person, you know, peace. Like, you know, are they gonna do it, or are they gonna be like, well, I'm not in a hospital building, so I can't have this conversation with them, or, you know, I don't really care if they feel well, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it just seems so weird like they have such a small power to help them physically mm -hmm. we're all spiritual doctors that's right yes, we are. that can give people peace and like, yes you know if you have that power give it to them absolutely <laughs> and what I love about this right here going along with that is that we have the power to give it to them by the word and also by our lives it's interesting when James in the context here he says, you can tell the difference between a teacher who has wisdom from above and a teacher who has worldly wisdom by their conduct. If a teacher has a good conduct, then, yeah, and if he's teaching the Word of God truthfully, rightly, then guess what? Righteousness. Peace. But the difference of a person who has worldly wisdom, you can tell that they have worldly wisdom by their conduct and also by this, what they're teaching. Are they teaching and implanting the seed or are they implanting their own opinions, their own doctrines? There's a good quote, and I forgot to type it down, and so I had to write it down here quickly by hand that I really love and I want to share with everybody. But this was a quote that was stated by Brother Dan Owen. He says, If I were to encourage our brotherhood in one area, specifically teaching and preaching, it would be that we need to let the scriptures speak from their context instead of stringing a bunch of unrelated passages together and trying to create doctrines where there are none. Amen? Amen. So in the context of people fighting and arguing and dividing, James is saying that the wisdom from above will result in peace. Those who exhibit God's wisdom and live righteously are intent on maintaining peace among brothers. They do their righteous acts, exhibit their good behavior in peaceful ways. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, does our teaching bring about division, jealousy, hate, and anger? Or does it bring purity, peace, mercy and good fruits, gentleness, reason, nonpartisan, and without hypocrisy? Our tongue is going to reflect if we have either worldly wisdom or heavenly wisdom. In summary, what James is saying in this text is that there are some people in the church who claim to be wise and understanding, verse 13. But who really do not have 
true wisdom. They may think they do, but they don't. These individuals think they possess biblical truth and that if you disagree with them, then you are wrong and need to readjust your thinking. And if you don't, then they will cause division in the church and blame it all on you. Arguments and fighting in churches is a clear indication that one party or both parties are not behaving according to incite from God. The separations that occur between brothers and sisters is due to following the perspectives or wisdom of the world and not God's wisdom. So again, we have to ask ourselves, what kind of teachers are we? We teach other people by our conduct and conversations. What are we going to do with this passage that James talks about right here? Let us remember that true wisdom seeks peace and righteousness. Let us remember that true wisdom does not exalt itself. And let us remember that whenever we have conflict in a congregation, we need to slow down and ask ourselves if we are exhibiting conduct according to the wisdom of God or the wisdom of the world. Any thoughts on this section before we move on to chapter 4? Questions, comments? Pretty plain and simple, huh? Mm -hmm. Like I say, and I'll keep on saying it, law of repetition. James does not hold back any punches. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. I worked for Rhonda McLean. She's the lady that started the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Yes. Really? <laughs> There's been quite some interesting discussions going on. Uh, they're pretty far out there in their beliefs. Oh, I was sure. told today that God didn't hear my prayers. And uh, mm. it's gotten to the point to where I just quote verses, you know, tell them Bible verses and, and to look up. But they're just, I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> really? I, I done, really don't. I mean, I've um, heard and seen that new you know, sanctuary place, yes, but yes. I haven't done much background on it if they are associated with any... Like they're a branch off on the Pentecostals, uh, or the branch off the Pentecostals. Pentecostals, yeah, yeah. Okay. I guess like a TV show with a spinoff. It is a spinoff, yeah. That's kind of descriptive. I guess they didn't wasn't doing things the way she wanted it, so she mm -hmm. has that church now. So, mm -hmm. and she invited it when I first started, and I went with her once, but I couldn't. Stay through the whole service. It, it, it's kind of scary to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I think when everybody experiences like their first, uh, I guess, Pentecostal yeah. uh, <laughs> service, it yeah, kind of yeah. 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 So, I know how you feel. <laughs> yeah. I told her, you know, she didn't think God was hearing me. I was going to keep praying for her. <laughs> uh, I remember sitting through yeah. one. Uh, just to kind of observe and the person next to me, I thought I had to, I was about to call the doctor and make sure, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't sure if he was, yeah. I'll just leave it at that. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> but as we go on into chapter four, James is continuing on. Uh, as you can probably call this maybe a bad chapter break, uh, but James's discussion is still on how uh, wisdom from above avoids worldliness. And so, in chapter 3, verse 13 through 18, James con uh, contrasted the wisdom of the world with the wisdom from above. And he had indicated, or he indicted uh, the teachers as following the wisdom of the world when he asked, um, who among you uh, are wise and understanding? Uh, so now, in chapter 4, verse 1 through 6, James seems to indict his readers as following the wisdom of the world when he says and asks, what causes quarrels and what causes fights? Fights, plural, among you. Hmm. Why is he asking that question? Apparently they're having dis differences. Apparently they're having differences. And it seems that they are exhibiting what kind of wisdom? Earthly. Earthly, worldly wisdom. The church members of Jerusalem were in a state of disorder and disharmony. So this, to James, was evidence of worldliness. Now, James uses the word world twice in verse 4, 
and speaks of friendship with the world as being hostility toward God. Now, when you do a word study on the Greek word uh, world in Scripture, uh, you will find that it is used in various ways. Number one, it may refer to just the earth, the blue planet that we walk upon. Matthew chapter 4, verse 8. It may also refer to all of humanity. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Thirdly, it can refer to sinful humanity as distinguished from Christians. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. And lastly, number four, which is the way that James is using it, it can refer to what our earthly circumstances offer us that opposes God. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. There John says, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. James is using the term here, the way that John uses it, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world, nor the things of the world. So Christians have been separated from their former relationship with the sinful world, Right? Once we have been baptized into Christ, what happens? Many things happen when we're baptized into Christ, I know, I understand, which is why it's, there's no wrong answer for this. Well, there can be, but I believe that everyone in here wouldn't give a wrong answer when it comes to being baptized into Christ. When we're baptized into Christ, we have what? Died to the world. Died to the world. And all of the desires in the world. We've died to it. We've crucified to it. We've died to sin, and we now live in Christ. No longer slaves to sin, but now, with the freedom that Christ gives us, being free from sin, we use that as an opportunity to be slaves of righteousness. To be his slaves. Slaves of the Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. Christians have been separated from their former relationship with the sinful world. Paul says that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, that we walked once walked according to the course of this world, but we escaped the corruption that is in the world. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Having overcome the world by faith, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5. And in baptism, we are crucified to the world, and the world was crucified to us. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, and chapter 2, verse 20. And so, when we do that, we have died to the elementary principles of this world. Paul says, Colossians chapter 2, verse 20. And so, yet, there's always a danger of a Christian falling back into the ways and the corruption of the world, as did Demas, who... Abandoned Paul and abandoned the faith. Why? Because he loved this present world. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. And so now as James brings up this rhetorical question with an obvious answer, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? He says, is it not this? that the source is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members so again keep in mind the context earlier James tells us that the wisdom from above produces peace and righteousness correct now in chapter 4 what seems to be the problem it starts with the word W Well, it's already right there. <laughs> worldliness. <laughs> worldliness. Worldliness. What are the symptoms of worldliness? Well, when we see them in chapter 30, disagreements, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. trouble, and trouble, not getting along, not getting along, <coughs> which 
What does that cause? Read verse 1 of chapter 4. Fights and quarrels. Oh. Fights and quarrels. Fights and quarrels. Now, does that sound like peace to you? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure the Church of Christ there in Jerusalem, instead of singing, When Peace Like a River, they're probably singing, When Quarrels Like a River. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, James answers the, his initial question with another rhetorical question. Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? The external quarrels and conflicts between brothers are the result of worldly desires within them. These Christians were seeking earthly pleasures that caused war within their members. Now, James uses a rare term here for pleasure, which is found only four times in the New Testament. This Greek word for pleasure is very rare. It occurs only four times in the New Testament. And this is actually where we get our English uh, term for hedonism. Hedonism. H-E-D-O-N-I-S-M. Hedonism. What does hedonism mean? <laughs> I know it's not our modern day vocabulary, but when somebody says that person, boy, they live their life just like a hedon, what does that mean? They do whatever they want to. They do whatever they want to, yeah. <laughs> and the person that just they does say whatever it's okay. they want to, they say it's okay. That's really the definition of it a person who does whatever they want to. They know the consequences of it, and they just don't care. It is the pursuit of pleasure as being a priority in one's life. It means to have a selfish desire or feelings that please only themselves. And the word members here, uh, right here, <clears throat> refers to... Uh, Parts of the body, uh, as James had used the term earlier in chapter 3, verse 6, in regards to the tongue, if you remember. So sin is so powerful that it can utilize the members of the physical body not only to exhibit itself, but also to wage war with others. To help better explain, think about Paul from Romans chapter 7, verse 23, regarding the vicious law that still operates in his members. Do you remember that? Hunter did a pretty I, good job covering it. I long to do good when I don't. Yep, absolutely. And evil when I wish I did. Yep. That's <laughs> not how he said it. No, you, no, you summarized it. I mean, that's fine. I mean, you summarized it uh, greatly. Uh, in the sense of what Paul is indicating there is that when I know to do good, <clears throat> I do not do it. I would not have known what covetous was if it wasn't for the law. And so when the law says, do not covet, members within my body, what are they saying? When somebody tells me that I can't do something, I want to do it. <laughs> it's like telling a child to, yeah, don't put your finger on a hot stove. Stop trying to put your finger on the hot stove. Okay, all right, go ahead, put your finger on there if that's what you really want to do. Let's see what happens. <laughs> I hope that doesn't come down to Arthur. I'm praying. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't want to do that to Arthur. I wouldn't want him to learn you know, the hard way. But I, but, I think ahead. of, uh, we read 1 John 2.15, I think of verse verse 16 after it. It says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life is yeah. not of the world, or is not of the Father, but is of the world. Um, it, it kind of makes me makes me think of chapter seven, like you know, the the law was there. It kind of made me think of those things, but also like we're we're just in the world. Like you're gonna see things, you're gonna desire things. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just called lust. Um, mm -hmm. It's gonna happen to us, and we're gonna be prideful too, as humans. Uh, Paul Paul put it pretty plainly, like I can't do anything about it with, with just the law and the motivation of just well you see that lust you know it's right there but, but don't touch it don't mm -hmm. enjoy it you know, don't, don't do that you, 
you can't really come back from that and control yourself unless you have the Spirit of God in you. I mean, that's what chapter 8 said. Uh, so unless we're using it and living through it, well, you're just going to have a losing battle. That's right. <laughs> And it's not going to be fun. It, doesn't, right. it sounded like turmoil. Yeah, so. absolutely. And so James, James is using that term in the same manner as Paul was there in Romans chapter 7. And so James, like Paul, views the body and its members as territory in which the power of sin, after being vanquished from its throne in the spirit, still maintains itself. In other words, it remains there. It's no longer within, it's no longer as a priority in your heart. And so it used to be. But now that you have been in Christ, it's no longer your priority. You made Christ your number one priority. You made him master and ruler of your life. Does that mean that, that uh, uh, fleshly desires just disappear? No. No. It still hangs around there. Why? Because it's still trying to fight. It's still trying to battle. It wants to get back on its number one spot. Now that Christ knocked it off, he wants to, he, as in desires, wants to get back to that number one spot. So in, in the case here, the tongue would be a primary weapon in such quarrels and conflicts. All right? The selfish desires of these Christians are using the members of their bodies to engage in conflict with one another. And so, he goes on to say, verse 2 and 3, he goes, You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. So James is saying that their lust is what is driving them to the actions they take. Their selfish desires are not being satisfied. And what happens if your selfish desires are not being satisfied? You do what? You lust and you not have, and so you what? You commit murder. That's pretty drastic. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you are envious, so you have the fleshly desire of envy, but it's not being satisfied. And you cannot attain it. And so, what do you do? If it's not being satisfied, you fight and quarrel. Envy, this is what I want. Oh, the men made this kind of decision? That's not the decision that I wanted them to make. I wanted purple carpet, not red carpet in the auditorium. Oh, I'm out of here. <laughs> you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. So what does it all boil down to? Right here. Your lust. It all boils down to your lust. This could mean a desire for various material things of this realm, but likely it means that they desire to get their way in the congregation and things are not going their way. So their reaction is to fight, quarrel, and commit murder. While James is not necessarily suggesting literal murder here, he could, but while he may not be suggesting literal murder in the physical sense, there is more than one way to commit murder in the figurative sense. In the Greek, James has the word murder emphasized in order to get the attention of his readers and to let it sink in as to how far that they are actually going. In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he tells them, saying, You have heard it is said, do not commit murder, but I say unto you what? You shall not even what? Hate somebody. You should not even hate somebody. There's a figurative sense of murder right there. Jesus sees hatred as murder. I'm sure there can be a lot of bitterness in the hearts of people when things don't go their way and when things are chaotic and disharmony 
they fight and quarrel and bicker. And what happens? You allow hatred to set in your heart. <clears throat> so you lust and do not have, so you commit murder. It may not be literal murder, but figurative. You may be hating with a deep, dark passion of your other brothers and sisters. We may kill off someone also in the way that we use our tongue. By discouraging them, criticizing them, cursing them, slandering them, or other means of verbal attack. We have certainly seen in the modern church cases where brothers have died spiritually because of the abuses of other Christians. Sometimes when a brother does not get his way, he will work against those who, who, are opposed, who opposed him to remove their influence against him. And we have observed how much sinful efforts have resulted in the spiritual demise of weaker brothers. I've seen it happen. I'm thinking of one congregation that's not too far from here where it's happened. And it breaks my heart. It really does. It happened, I believe, January or 2015, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe early in the year of 2015. I had no clue that it happened until I came to visit in summer of July 2015 and went to worship over there and sure enough there's only about like 20 people there hmm. so I asked they told me their side I asked if they had any maybe like a, a log like do you keep a log book or anything of like this taking place do you have any audio recording of I guess the sessions that you all have had or anything and didn't provide any and so I met with uh, the person that they all ganged up and attacked on, and he had all the evidence right there. And he was actually the innocent one. And it was a congregation of over 150. Why? Because one man there, one man, slandered his name, slandered his lessons, and he wanted to take the spotlight now, to this day, he has that spotlight. But look at what he's cost. The church there now is dying because of that. You cannot underestimate the power of Satan. That's right. Nor his ways, because he works so slowly mm -hmm. and so carefully that people are unaware. Mm -hmm. That it's Satan. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And he does that, tries to do that with all of us through television mm -hmm. or even the radio yeah. or the newspapers and the magazines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Homosexuality has come very slowly, but it's there everywhere. Yeah. The advertisements. Mm -hmm. So I just don't watch television. Yeah, <laughs> doesn't get on, anyways. I just, I don't, but then when I, if I do turn it on for something, I'm shocked. Yeah. That's yeah. how because I don't see it enough. I'm shocked at how far downhill it's going rapidly. Oh, absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> That's the world that we live in, do we not? It's in, it's in commercials, even. You mm -hmm. know, they're they're trying to sell to everybody, every possible. Yeah. Type of situation. Yeah. Satan is so tough. Yes, he is. And when it says roaring lion, it, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. I, I say this uh, kind of sarcastically. It's like, you know, the people this letter was written to is like, okay, they were quarreling and fighting, but then we had this passage, and then, you know, nobody ever did it after that. Of course they did. And I, I, think, I think a lot of that is like we don't we don't read enough of these passages and think about self. We see like okay, lust and murder. Okay, yeah, that's that's probably like a different type of person that's going to get in the middle of all that. Mm -hmm. Like murder, that's not that's not me. Yeah. But like we need to be reading these passages and thinking about ourselves, yes, not not somebody else. Obviously, there's examples to learn from. Uh, but there's so many times that we need to think about ourselves because that's the only way we're going to guard and learn from it mm -hmm. is if you're thinking about 
how this applies to you. Uh, right. We just don't think about like how that can seep into our own life. But I think one of the best things when we talk about lust, uh, if you've got nothing better to think about, then Satan is just going to constantly fill your heart and mind and your eyes with all kinds of lust. Like mm-hmm. We've got to fill that with something. And I think of the passage, Ephesians 5, one of my f- favorite verses, uh, verse 18, And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And I've always said that those almost seem to contrast each other. You know? <laughs> Don't be drunk on wine, but be on the Spirit. You know? yeah. Yeah, be full of something, yeah. uh, and it's a powerful substance. You know, the most powerful uh, as we as we get, uh, and it's a it's a great thing, and that's what we got to be f- full of. Mm-hmm. And if you're only going to do that two three hours a week, the rest of us can be full of lust, and that's why. Like, if I'm in the car, I'm cranking up some worship tunes or something like I don't come here and I'm like oh those five songs that about did it for me I, I don't want to hear that I don't want to hear that it's like hey give me some more of that I want to be filled with the spirit you yes. know that's so we need to have lust for God you know that's that's what we need absolutely <laughs> absolutely and looking at it in the context what is it that needs to be that we need to be filling our lives with in the context he already stated go back to chapter 3 verse 17 purity fill our lives with peace fill our lives with gentleness fill our lives with reason fill our lives with mercy and good fruits fill our lives with nonpartisan partiality fill our lives with holiness and sincerity without hypocrisy those are the characteristics of God's wisdom we need to be filling that in our lives when we fill that in our lives what's the result verse 18 peace peace, uh, peace among one another peace among one another and James is good stuff we hit our mark but if I may let's go ahead and finish this real quick <laughs> it's been a while it's been a while two weeks you know since you know we've done James and so I just ask for a little bit you know five more minutes <clears throat> but James ends verse two with the statement you do not have because you do not ask and then elaborates in verse three you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Now this asking, what, what is this asking may be referring to? Prayer, prayer. Prayer, there we go, folks. Yes, prayer. And James condemns them for fighting rather than asking. One who is intent on getting his own way would not consider petitioning God. You ever notice that person who's very unreasonable and does not get their way? They never even at all suggest, hey, you know, let's pray about this matter first. They go right into the attack, do they not? <laughs> since prayer is a submission, or since prayer is a submission to the will of God, yet when they finally decide to pray, they ask with selfish motives for which God will not grant their request. The purpose behind these requests to God does not have in mind godly results. Their purpose behind these requests to God is not about trying to bring peace and harmony within the church. It's only to fulfill their selfish wants and desires. It's all about me and I'm praying for what I want so that I can spend it on my own pleasures. Now, I want you to note, six terms in verse 2 indicate a kind of violence that is associated with war and the results of war. James, of course, is using the terminology in a figurative way to depict the kind of infighting that's going on in the church. 
and I thought I had it on the slide here. Well, I forgot to put it. But verse 1, you see the word quarrels, all right? Well, that word quarrels in the Greek literally means war. It means war. It's the word they used for their physical military war battles that they have. And the word conflicts literally means fights. And wage war literally means soldiering, like a soldier, soldiering. It's a person who is constantly a sar uh, that's a soldier who is constantly on the lookout. They're those dogmatic watchdog type of people. They're looking for that one thing where they can call you out on and try to expose you to everybody and slander your name and so forth because you just don't agree with them on a certain matter. <laughs> Opinion matter, I should say. And then in verse 2, you see the word commit murder, which literally that is, you know, to kill. And then you have the word fight and quarrel. So six terms that all relate to, like, talk about ongoing military type battles. <laughs> all those words just are in uh, correlation with huge battles. Our war should not be directed against one another, but against who? The devil. The devil. In verse 7, James will say what? Submit yourselves therefore to God and resist who? The devil. The devil, and he will flee from you. Our battle is not against one another. It's against Satan. Satan wants us to try to fight and chew each other out. That's what he wants. Why? Why? Why does he want to do that? Why does he want us to fight and bicker? To pull you away from God. To pull you away from God. He knows that he's lost. And so now he lost against Jesus when Jesus conquered death. And so now he wages war against those who follow his commandments. The church. He now is wanting to divide the church. He knows he's lost, and he wants to take everybody, as many people, as down as he can with them. We need to stand against and oppose Satan, not God. Any other thoughts on that? We'll go ahead and close it here, and then next week we'll come back and pick up at verse 4 of James chapter 4. so much as always for just this wonderful opportunity that we have to study more uh, into the book of James to understand the wisdom uh, that's from above the wisdom that you provide for us the wisdom that is your son Jesus Christ he is the wisdom that came down from above and he offers that wisdom to all who ask and father we are always constantly asking for your wisdom from above so that we can be able to live at peace and harmony with the church family, with one another. Being able to see things the way that you see it to bring lost souls to your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, as this upcoming 4th of July parade, we see this as an opportunity of being able to teach others by our conduct and by our conversations and the way that we communicate with them and the way that we behave in front of them. Uh, let us really uh, utilize this opportunity and to uh, teach them and to show them that we have the wisdom from above and it can be offered to them and, uh, and, and, and to be able to, uh, uh, to bring them uh, into uh, the fold and into the church of your son, Jesus Christ, to bring souls to heaven with us. And that's all it's about, is to think about souls so that we can sow the seed and that we can reap righteousness and peace. Uh, we thank you so much for your writer, James. Um, who is just uh, an outstanding writer who is guided by inspiration. 
and uh, the things that we've discussed and the things that we've learned, let us uh, evaluate and examine ourselves. Uh, let us think on these things and look at ourselves and to apply it to our lives each and every day to be doers of the word. It's our prayer through your son's name, Jesus. Amen. I got a question for y'all. I bought a watermelon yesterday.